Well, welcome to the Cinnabar. Now check out this gorgeous Colt Lightning magazine rifle. This one's just a beauty. 95% plus original condition. Um, one of the very last ones made in 1902. This one has a half octagon barrel, which is an extremely rare feature on a, on a Lightning rifle. It holds 15 rounds of 4440, and therein lies the problem. You see, thanks to the passage of Measure 114 in Oregon, in less than 30 days, this rifle will be considered a high-capacity assault weapon and banned in the state of Oregon. Now, if you think that's bad, it just gets worse because when that terrible law goes into effect, all gun sales across the state of Oregon will cease at least temporarily until all the mechanisms are put in place and all the training courses designed for you to go to the state on bended knee and ask their permission to exercise your Second Amendment rights by buying a firearm. Now, if you think this is just Oregon gun owners problem, think again, because if this terrible law isn't overturned by the courts, you can bet that it's coming to a state near you. Now stick around, we'll fill you in on all the gory details. Now this measure was sold to the voters of Oregon as common sense and reasonable gun control. But we're gonna look at the details and I'll explain to you why this is neither common sense nor reasonable. Now this thing reads like a laundry list of the things that gun control advocates love. We've got enhanced background checks, even though Oregon already had one of the strongest background check laws in America. We've got permitting with onerous requirements before a permit can be issued. We've got registration and a publicly searchable database of any of the purchases or permits that have been issued. Now think about that one. And then our favorite, of course, is the 10 round magazine ban that turns beautiful collectible old rifles like this one into an illegal contraband firearm in the state of Oregon. So stick around, we'll go through each of those different uh, provisions of this law and explain how they've, they've been uh, manipulated to make it so difficult to exercise your Second Amendment rights in the state of Oregon. So let's first talk about background checks because background checks are of course very, very popular with voters. So this, this measure was largely sold to the voters on the strength of background checks in Oregon. But as I mentioned, Oregon already had one of the strongest background check laws in the United States. In fact, if I were to take this rifle and hand it to somebody other than an, an immediate family member, that's a transferable event. and We'd have to go through a criminal background check for that to be a legal transfer. I mean, it was that strict. No gun show loopholes, none of that. It hasn't been for years. But even on the ballot, where you marked either yes or no, under no, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, it said we would retain the current system where the seller or transfer would have to request a criminal background check to sell a firearm. That's not the case at all. It's an absolute lie and was right on the ballot where people believed if they marked no, we would have no background checks in Oregon, which we already have had for years, and we'll continue to have whether that ballot measure passed or not. So it shows the, the depths that, that these folks will go to telling out and out lies, and that it got on the ballot that way, and that our Secretary of State's office allowed that lie to be right there next to the, the check that you put on your ballot. For that alone, this thing should be thrown out on its ear by the first court that sees it. Now let's talk about the permitting portion of this law. And this is where the majority of even law enforcement across the state was against this measure becoming law. You see, it involves onerous training, not only in the classroom, but on the range to show proficiency with these firearms. And it dumps the responsibility for developing all these training courses and administering all these training courses on local law enforcement with no funding mechanism. So particularly out here in, in rural Oregon where sheriff's departments and local police departments are strapped already, they're gonna have to figure out how to develop and administer these courses, take police officers 
off patrol and dealing with the, the, these administrative tasks, it's a, a nearly impossible situation. And on top of that, if you're a police officer, you're not exempt. You have to go through this whole thing too if you want to purchase a firearm other than your service firearm. So if you want to, say, purchase this rifle here, if you're a law enforcement officer, you still have to go through the training. If you're a concealed carry permit holder, and I have been for 30 years, I went through classroom training and, and range training and all those things that we, we have to have to get these permits, doesn't matter. You go, still have to go through this these programs that haven't even been developed yet. In my case, I have two federal firearms licenses. One personally for, as a collector, a, a Type 3 Cure and Relics license. I have a Type 1 for my business. Doesn't matter. I still have to go through this training. They're trying to make it as difficult as possible. And that's why I say when this law goes into effect, all gun sales will cease across the state because none of these programs have even been set up. And that leads to the information they get from this permitting system becoming part of a registration scheme that now is publicly searchable because they're required to keep all the information that they get from permit holders and any of the transactions in a database, a publicly searchable database. So we've got the, the wonderful um, two-pronged snake here, or two-headed snake of permitting and registration all in one fell swoop. And then to cap it all off, the public gets to see any transaction or any permit that's been issued and know exactly what firearms you've purchased or own. So let's talk about the situation for a first time firearms buyer in the future here in Oregon. And we'll use it as an example, say a young single mother who's trying to get out of an abusive relationship. Now, she can of course go down and file a restraining order and often that happens, but of course we all know how um, that plays out many times. So she wants something more to protect herself and her children from a past abuser. So she wants to buy a firearm. And of course she should get some kind of training, but it should be the training of her choice. And of course it's fairly reasonable to get that kind of training now. Now, in the future, she's gonna to have to go through some kind of state approved training that likely is gonna be extremely expensive. And then we've got another problem because this young mother doesn't have a firearm of her own, maybe hasn't even handled a firearm very much in the past. And now she has to go to a range and show proficiency. But because she doesn't have a permit, she can't even handle a firearm. You know, even the person at the range can't hand her a firearm and show her how to do it. That's a transferable event in the state of Oregon. So how does she even show proficiency? How can she go to the range, having never handled a firearm before, and get the training that she needs? And you can see the catch-22 that's been set up here. And I don't think it was unintentional at all. That's the kind of devilish details we've got in this law to keep people from being able to get these permits to purchase the firearms. Now let's talk about the high capacity magazine ban. The bans any magazine fixed or detachable that is capable of carrying more than 10 rounds. And of course we know that a lot of our common, particularly semi-automatic carry firearms have more than 10 round capacity from the factory. These are the magazines that come from the factory. Um, <laughs> And then there's, there's rifles like this with a fixed magazine with, with more than 10 round capacity. Now, they tried to make this one palatable to hoodwink the voters again by saying, if you already own a high capacity, more than 10 round magazine, it'll be grandfathered in. You won't have to, you won't have to turn that in. You won't have to dispose of it. And then they, they excluded a few types of guns from it. Like, say this 1873 Winchester. It's... Lever action. Lever actions were excluded. Even though this one actually will hold, it's got a little longer barrel, so it'll hold 16 rounds of 4440 ammunition. They've excluded 22s. So this Colt Lightning small frame, which is basically the same rifle as this one, but in 22 caliber, it's excluded. And then they've excluded 
what is federally considered by ATF as an antique, anything manufactured before 1899. So of course this rifle doesn't meet any of those in, as a modern uh, assault weapon of, of some sort according to these yahoos. Now, the other thing that they don't tell you though, until you read into the details, is that yes, you can keep your high capacity magazine, but it can't leave your property. Well, that's really good for your carry gun. Now you can't carry it off your property and you can't protect yourself when you leave your property with the, your carry gun with a f the factory magazine that came with the gun. Okay, just crazy. You can take it to a shooting range or you can take it to a shooting competition or a couple other little narrowly defined places that can go off your property. But if you do that, you have to remove the magazine, lock it in a separate container where, where you can't get the two together um, while you're transporting it back and forth. Just crazy. Now, the other thing that they've done, and this is really nefarious, is they've shifted the burden of proof for if you've owned that magazine when the law went into effect to the owner. Now in our American legal system, the burden of proof is, is on the state to prove that you've broken the law. But in this case, they've shifted that burden to the owner. So our, our county sheriff, who's, who's a very good supporter of the Second Amendment, has advised people in this county to take pictures of, of all your high capacity magazines or your 10 round or more magazines then email them to yourself so there's some kind of a date stamp and time on them to, to be able to prove that. Now, of course, this burden shifting, as I understand it, is another um, area that, that could be challenged constitutionally because it, you know, it's, a, it's a violation of the Constitution to burden shift that, that burden of proof onto individuals rather than the state. So we're hopeful that there's another issue there that can, can uh, resolve this in, through the court system. Now you might be asking yourself, how in the world could the voters of any state in the United States of America pass such a terrible law, depriving themselves of a constitutional right? But you have to understand how Oregon's made up. Now, we're primarily a rural state and, and pretty conservative throughout most of the state. But we have one major metropolitan area where most of the population is concentrated, in Portland. Portland's gone from the most beautiful, most livable big city in America over the last couple of decades because of failed leadership and keep electing this never-ending bunch of dipsticks running their city that have just run it into the ground and turned it into a cesspool of crime and homelessness. So you can understand the despair of the people in Portland. They don't know how to turn this around. They don't know how to turn, get their city back, get their communities back. They feel they're in fear. So they're willing to try anything. And I can kind of understand it. If I live there, I, I might be willing to try just about anything too. But of course, this isn't going to solve anything for them. In fact, it may make it worse. They won't be able to defend themselves. The police are going to be busy fiddling around with this stuff instead of being out on the street trying to protect them. So you can see that while out here, like in our rural county, we, we voted 90, almost 90% 90 against this. Our, our county sheriff is, is vehemently opposed to this. Um, but our 3,000 votes out here didn't, didn't want to drop in the bucket compared to the votes that, that were garnered in Portland that were overwhelmingly in support of this law. Now what's particularly heartbreaking about this whole mess is that this measure could have and should have been easily defeated. You see, this thing passed by the narrowest of margins. So it wouldn't have taken educating some of those folks who were taken in by the half-truths and lies that the promoters were telling about this thing to sway this election. Now, a quick look at the Secretary of State's website for Oregon and their elections division shows that $2,300,000 was spent to promote this measure, but only barely $40,000 was spent to defeat it. So where were these big national gun rights organizations that are constantly hitting us gun owners, owners up for money 
when this fight was taking place. Well, I can tell you they weren't here in Oregon, that's for sure. They abandoned their members, their donors, the average gun owner in the state of Oregon. And there's no other way to put that. And I think they were sitting back in their cushy offices somewhere cheering this thing on, to be honest with you. I think they'll tell you that they were looking at the big picture and this thing is so poorly written that it needs to go through the court system and be overruled and become the law of the land. But what did they do to the Oregonian who wants to go out and purchase a firearm now to defend himself? Or to use a firearm that he's already purchased for that purpose? What's it do to the mom and pop gun shop owners who in a three, in three weeks or so all their gun sales are going to stop and who knows how long it will be before they can sell another gun in the state of Oregon. What's it do to just the average gun owner who wants to exercise his Second Amendment rights? Shouldn't have to have a reason, a justification to the state or ask permission from the state to exercise his constitutionally guaranteed Second Amendment rights. We've just been abandoned. We're left in a lurch. We don't know how long this is going to go on, if it's going to be overturned, when it's going to be overturned. It's a mess. And we were left defenseless. Now, if you think this can't happen in your state, you're wrong. It can. Now, there's some states it's not likely to happen anytime soon, but you need to be paying attention, particularly if you reside in a blue state. These kind of things can happen. Be diligent about your constitutionally guaranteed Second Amendment rights and all of your constitutionally guaranteed rights. I've heard it said that your rights can't be voted away. Well, they can be. And hopefully if the courts work, that can be overruled. But in, a, in about three weeks, ours are going to be gone. So I hope you've learned something. Um, not a particularly fun episode to make, but I uh, thought it was important. Until next time, happy trails from the Cinnabar.